Will you pray with me? Oh God, who sees us, who loves us, who calls us, who defends us, who touches us, would you be with us in a special way in this time? May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So in the church year, there are a couple different seasons. We just finished um, Easter and um, Pentecost, and last week was Trinity Sunday, so we celebrated uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Brother, Sustainer, Comforter. And we begin this time called Ordinary Time. An ordinary time is maybe it is definitely the longest season of the year. It's kind of split up a little bit, but it is definitely the longest. It's what happens in between the big special days, right? The next time we celebrate a big special day in the church will be the fall. At the end of the fall, actually, when we start Advent. So like Christmas time. That's when, that's when we will be back in a special season. But this is where most of our lives are lived, right? This is where we spend most of our days. And so today, in this story, we greet Jesus in some ordinary time. And I want to invite you to think about the ordinary time that we are living in. So there's these four, these four groups of people that Jesus attends to. Um, and I, I want to say that for sure, that he attends to them. He doesn't just brush them off, but he attends to them in different ways, but he attends to them. So first we have Mac, Matthew, uh, who uh, Zach talked about earlier. He was a tax collector. He was at work. He wasn't just like known as a tax collector. Like Jesus came and talked to him when he was at the booth. And he said, follow me. Jesus didn't ask him to turn from his ways. He didn't have him fill out a test of worthiness. But he asked him to follow and he did. And then he immediately went to his house. (laughs) Which is very personal, very intimate. And he shares a meal. As Zach said, this guy was seen as a co-conspirator. So like Jesus' family. Matthew was somebody who was on the other side. Who was responsible for maybe his family not having the money that they could have in their pockets to to provide for their family. He was seen as an enemy. Where'd my penny go? He was one of these. (laughs) And then we have this leader from a synagogue, one of the religious people. His daughter has died. And he says, come, please do something about this. And you'll notice in the story, everybody laughed when Jesus said, go home. She's not dead, but she's just sleeping. Dad knew. Dad knew Jesus could do something about this. And he did. Brought the daughter back to life. Meanwhile, along the way, I love this story because there's just so much chaos happening, right? Like he's going through the crowds on his way to go raise a child from the dead, and this woman grabs his cloak. Doesn't even touch Jesus' skin, just his fabric. And he had, she had faith that he could heal her chronic condition. For those of you with chronic conditions, you might appreciate this story. Something that plagues you day after day after day. Twelve years. And because it was an issue of blood, it made her unclean. So she had to be away from people. So no wonder she thought, I should not touch this man, but maybe if I just touch his clothing. Maybe. Maybe. And her bleeding stopped. But Jesus doesn't just let that happen he draws his attention to her. I love that Mother God song. I think 
Luke said that, oh, we're doing this one again. Um, it is one of my favorites. Because in, in the traditional how deep the father's love for us, the father turns his gaze away. Okay? In this song, the mother, her gaze stays. And so he turns to her and he said, who took power from me? And she speaks up. So now she has a voice. She isn't just someone in the crowd. She is someone whose gaze Jesus has. And she says, it was me. And he says, lady, your faith has made you well. Not I have made you well, me, holy man, who's walking around with magical cloaks, but you, your faith, that if I could just get close enough, maybe. So he credits her faith. But there's one last people, the Pharisees, or a group of religious leaders. These were Jesus' people, so they weren't just some other people. They were from his tradition. They saw Matthew, our penny guy, being called by this rabbi. And he shares table fellowship with him, but not only with just Matthew, whom he just called, who we're just assuming he has some drastic uh, transformation. Um, It's not always how it works, right? Like, We're often transformed over and over and over again. But he's having dinner with Matthew and other guys who are taking his people's money. And they say, this does not fit. What are you doing? If you were really a man of God, you would not be sitting at that table with those people. And he goes to people who are unclean. He honors the woman in the street who's unclean. I wonder if the Pharisees had, if those religious leaders had thought, maybe we could pray for her healing. I don't know. Maybe they did. But Jesus, just by being present to her, did. But these, these folks kind of saw themselves as superior as people whose company others were not worthy of. So I love, I love this combination of people. These short passages revealing something to us about God and who God loves. There isn't a script, a chosen list, or a list of requirements that people had to meet. He calls folks we might expect and certainly folks that we would not. He allows people to touch him. That's almost, to me, more vulnerable than touching someone else. When when I was pregnant, um, people would touch my belly, and that felt like the most invasive thing. And so I actually touched somebody's belly back when they did that to me, and they were so taken aback. I'm like, does this feel comfortable to you? You were in my... No, this is when I was pregnant with Theo. People did touch my belly when I was pregnant with you too, but it's a, it's a vulnerable spot, not to mention life growing underneath it, right? So, yes, <laughs> and my ribs and all kinds of stuff. Um, but he allows folks to touch him, and he feels that touch of de- desperation, knowing that he carries great weight with him and does not allow that person behind the touch to be lost. He admonishes her. And he sees a father deep in his bewildering grief and fear and accompanies him to his dead daughter and gives her life. These people are deeply aware of their need are met by the eyes, the voice, the hands, the presence of God in the flesh as found in Jesus. Mercy. That is what is shown in each of these stories. Jesus' mercy that he offers to the person right in front of him. However, those who don't recognize their need, whose pride allows them to keep their distance from the other and gives them permission to judge... Jesus says, oh, no, friend. (laughs) 
You've got it twisted and upside down. These folks are who you should be having dinner with. Folks who are aware of their brokenness. My beloved. We should be gathering them up, not turning them away. These are the treasures of the kingdom. You clearly don't need to be nourished here as you are already well fed. I'm going to nourish these ones. Go and learn from this situation and do differently. Doesn't even invite them to explore all of the reasons why. He just says, go, learn from this and do something different. In that ordinary time, in the day-to-day moments of people's lives, Jesus called and defended and touched and allowed himself to be touched by those who were living in the shadows, on the margins, looked down upon, and desperate, all with different circumstances. But the one thing that they had in common was that they knew they needed Jesus. So in this first week of Ordinary Time, we're going to do something a little different. Um, Now that all of our special seasons and our special days have ended, we want to reflect with you. Sometimes we do these things that are life-changing, but then we just go on to the next thing. So we want to take a couple moments today to reflect and invite you to reflect with us about some very similarly lived experiences of standing with and learning from folks who Jesus would likely have shared the table with, whom he would defend, whom he would offer his very self to, his very presence. We're also going to share a couple moments of missing the mark because we don't have it all together. And there's some really practical things in which we might have missed the mark a little bit this week um, of not being aware of what people actually needed because we too are desperately in need of that guidance. So Zach, I'd like you to invite you to come up. We mentioned a lot of different things that have happened in the last two weeks. We want to focus in a little bit on two. (laughs) The first, we want to focus in on the Advocacy Day in Harrisburg. And we'll leave a moment or two for those of you who were there to to add anything Zach might have missed. So do you you want me to explain what happened that day? Yeah, share what it means to have shown up um, for folks who are on the margins and for... Sure. Um, So we showed up with power interfaith. And you want to go to the slide with the picture? There we go. Actually, Open Table was the most well-represented church from Pottstown, despite being a concentrated group of folks. We had one, two, three, four, five, five and a half people there. You're the half person. (laughs) Laura was working that day for Paul Friel and then joined us in and out and actually spoke with some of the power people. Um, So what we were doing was we were urging our representatives, our senators, to uh, agree to a three-part policies in terms of the budget. We're trying to convince people that budgets are moral documents. They say in reality what you actually cherish. Um, We wanted them to commit to fair funding for our schools, first and foremost. And then in terms of livable wages, we, uh, there was two aspects of that. We wanted them to commit to a at least $15 an hour minimum wage. We are by far the lowest in our northeastern area, even West Virginia has higher minimum wage than Pennsylvania does. Um, we are still at 725, which hasn't budged in 25 years. Um, New Jersey's almost 15 for comparison. But more than that, to uh, end the local preemption, which means that local municipalities are not allowed to make their own minimum wages. 
So we know the, the cost of living is different in Philadelphia and, let's say, Bedford, but they have to have the same minimum wage. We can't have, like, a just Philadelphia is 15. So we talked with them about that. And the last one had to do with whole, whole home repairs, which is a big win that Powers Advocacy folks had in this particular budget in which people are able, there's money set aside for people to fix their homes and stay in their homes. It is, uh, it is about uh, justice for people who otherwise would end up on the streets, but it's also about creating energy efficient homes, using less resources, and bettering our planet. Um, these are justice issues, they are earth issues. And so we went to our own individual representatives and senators. Uh, we met with the chief of staff for uh, Tracy Pennychuck, Pennycook, Pennycook, um, the chief of staff. We did not meet with our representative that, uh, you know, lazy, good for nothing. No, I'm just kidding. Joe Cerisi Joe was Cerisi. one of the, he was one of the speakers at the power event. So he was definitely on our side. Uh, so it was a, it was a really, uh, I thought it was a really powerful day, uh, pun intended, that of just creating a spirit. And we were encouraged by the speakers that this was the largest advocacy day that Power had done so far, but it was not nearly large enough. That there were still seats available in the church that we met in. That we can still be louder and more frightening to the lawmakers to remind them that they work for us and that it is, uh, we're pushing them to have uh, moral uh, budgets and actions. Anybody else who was there want to share? You weren't there. Well, I, folks who were actually at the, at the advocacy day. <clears throat> yeah, if anyone who was there wants to share anything that stuck out to you, anything... We were in the hallway doing a chant, and we were <laughs> chanting for, what do we want? Fair funding. When do we want it? Now. And no kidding, we did it three times, and she showed up like Beetlejuice. <laughs> it was amazing. Anybody else want to share anything about that day? We need more buses. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts, Marlene? No, don't, I know you don't really care, but... We need to keep the urgency. Yep. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. All the 50 legislative visits we did and the 15 we did before we went, there's still not a plan of how to fix it so the funding will be equitable. Yes. And so what I shared on Tuesday when we were out there is it's not the force of water that cracks the rock, <laughs> it's persistence. And so we need to be persistent in being there again and again yeah. and again. Uh, I yeah. quoted you at least six times in the past <laughs> couple of days just from that. Yeah, I think, I think of it, oh go ahead. Room on Tuesday, I even pointed to where the Capitol was. I said, There's the rock we need to crack, and we do it through persistence. I always think of, and, and maybe Laura, you're the one who, who shared with this with me at one point. Of the, there's a story about this parable where uh, Jesus is talking about the persistence of prayer, and it's, it's like a woman who who needs this judge to rule in her favor and he kind of keeps brushing her off and she just keeps coming back and keep coming back and he says fine have what you want and she gets what she wants and I, I, I think that is what power is um, power interfaith that, that we just kind of keep being the persistent widow who we're not going to stop we're not going to stop <clears throat> Well, I'm going to move us to um, yesterday a little bit. Um, maybe you can go to the next, next picture. Yeah. 
So uh, Deb is actually wearing one of the shirts that uh, Zach made these, by the way. Um, he designed and ironed on these beautiful circles. Um, the last time I did an iron on t-shirt was in <laughs> 1998. And the technology is exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we had a table at the uh, Chester County Pride Fest um, in Phoenixville. And so we had a table where we had um, several flags um, that were not exhaustive. We, had, we heard from several people, where, where's my flag? Where's my flag? Um, and so one of the things we learned, um, representation is important, right? Um, we had some letters um, on the table that were written specifically to trans youth um, that were written by UCC. UCC members around the country, yes. clergy and lay folk. It yeah. was for Trans Day of Visibility this year. Yes. And so Zach um, put them in envelopes and numbered them so that people didn't think they were getting a generic letter. But you were getting number 33. You were getting number da da da. Um, and then there was also our basket of affirmations. If you remember the last couple weeks, we wrote down affirmations and we passed them out. Um, there was something else on the table, too. Oh, and our stickers and, and the CD catchers. <laughs> um, we had our shirts on that said God is love and uh, this beautiful banner that Anne created, as well as the beautiful cross that Anne created. We use this for our Pennsylvania Southeast Conference meeting, um, and we were like, we need, we need this. We need to use this. So, um, so visibility, we showed up. We brought some water and passed out water to folks who are coming by. Um, the comments that we got, um, I said earlier, it means so much that churches are here. Thank you. We got lots of tears. We had a gentleman come by who said, can I take a couple of these letters? I have a lot of friends who could really use this. And I don't know who was with me. Luke, were you with me? And he took, I don't know, 10? Like he took a ton and we were like, oh, you can just take the whole basket. Actually, there might be other people who are coming. So we still have some left over and now I'm regretting. We didn't just give them to him because he has a group of people who this would be a word of hope to. And the affirmations, I had, there was other people who would take a couple of them because like, things are really good today, but I'm going to need these tomorrow, right? Um, so it was a day for me um, of a lot of learning, a lot of learning um, that, number one, showing up really, 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 really matters. Um, meeting people face to face, and saying that Jesus loves you really, 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 really matters. Having a shirt that says, God is love, especially when that is not the message. God is love if, or some kind of thing. Um, but uh, we had our brochures, we had, and a lot of people did. They're like, where, where are you located? What are you doing? What are you up to? Um, so that was really cool. Um, that's kind of a brief overview of the day. We were there from 12 to 5. I also want to give a word, big word of thanks to, um, to Zach and to Anne, especially for the setup, for the creating of all of this stuff that we could physically give to people. Um, and, and candy, your, your CDs were really beautiful too. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, but that's just kind of a brief overview of what yesterday looked like. And I wanted to give you space to share. I know you had a couple of things that were in your mind. Yeah, so first of all, the thing that impacted folks the most, I think, at the table was the letters to trans youth. And this is something I have heard over and over and over again, that right now, in this moment of time and history, the LGB of the LGBT is feeling threatened as usual, but uh, society as a whole is kind of more accepting of. But there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of anti-trans bills that are going through local governments right now. They are under attack despite being such a small portion of the population. There are laws all over the place. In, in Florida now, trans people cannot receive health care. Um, like health care they were receiving prior. They are now not able to receive the same care they were receiving before. Uh, trans lives are under attack. And so it was suggested to me um, 
by uh, my cousin, actually, to make sure that there is something specifically for trans lives right now. Um, and so even those who came by that were not trans youth saw that and said, a lot of people said, can I write a letter? I want to write a letter. I want to support trans youth. I want to let them know how much I love them. And we were not set up for that. <laughs> but that was a, a good learning experience that, you know what? Folks who are there, they want to give. They want to love. There is so much love overflowing into the streets that, you know, maybe we're not just giving stuff away next time. Maybe we're giving people opportunities to spread love as well. Um, so it was my first time at one of these, at, at this event. It was wonderful to see so many churches represented. There were a bunch of them, which was really cool. Five churches. Five UCC churches. Presbyterians. And then there were UUs. Presbyterians. There were UU. There was a Lutheran. There was a Baptist church. Um, two Baptist churches, I think. There was a bunch. And they scattered us all throughout. So, like, you could just keep walking, and then there'd be another church and another church and another church. And that felt really, really wonderful. Um, because in my mind, there's like, there are the churches that are not accepting, right? And that's a lot of them. Then there are churches that are accepting, but like super quiet about it. We're like, yeah, show up. You'll be loved. It's great. We love you. We're not going to make a big fuss about it, but like, you're welcome here, which is, you know, a way of being an ally, I suppose. But like, I think that's where a lot of progressives are. We're really nice and non-confrontational. And then the next level is the open churches that are then out in the community. You know, the ones that put rainbows in their logos so people know what they're about, who, sh who show up at, fe at Pride Fest and they give out stuff. And that's like another level of connection. And that's kind of where, where we were and what I thought was kind of like the pinnacle of advocacy. <laughs> like, we're there. We're in the midst. We're loving you. We're giving you blessings. We're all of that. Um, and then there was a, 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 a woman there um, who showed up. Well, you don't need to switch just yet. I'll tell you when. Um, who showed up and was in the middle of it. So, like, right on Main Street in the middle between the two with a sign that had a number of repent and follow Jesus, you know, hellfire and damnation kind of a, a sign. And she was just standing there with it. There was no megaphone. And then people were yelling and talking and whatever to her. And I walked past her. I was like, oh, of course there had to be someone. And then we walked up, and then we walked back. And I knew that she was there. Folks had said that she was there. And I just, whatever, just ignore her. She's not there. Um, I did have to explain her presence to my son who can read, which was a lot harder than explaining what Pride Fest was about. But then as I'm watching a magic show, uh, we got a text from, from Laura Johnson who said, uh, this is at the Main Street intersection in case anyone wants to go out and hand out stuff. Winky face. And she said, maybe someone in a collar should show up. And I felt that in my gut in that moment. Maybe someone should show up. There's how many thousands of people here? There's how many churches represented here? And that woman is still standing there alone with her hateful signs, talking to people, yelling at people, whatever. Maybe we should show up. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. So I made a little sign, and you can go over, that just said, um, God loves everyone, even her. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a little rainbow flag so people who were passing by knew what I, I was about. Okay, and just stood there, mostly. Um, had a couple of conversations. I got a lot of hugs. I got a lot of high fives. I got like a thousand pictures taken of me. Um, but there were two interactions that stood out to me. One of them was a woman who said, um, I wanted to thank you for being here on behalf of my friend who can't be in the presence of, of this. Um, they have had so much religious trauma, and her presence here has, is triggering them so badly that this, this whole thing feels ruined now. That this person has stayed right in the middle. We cannot go anywhere without seeing it and being reminded. This is supposed to be a place where we celebrate 
and I cannot escape the hate no matter where we go. And I wanted to thank you for standing here because when we walked back the second time and saw you there, it felt a little bit more like we were safer, that there was a protection out there for us. Um, we had a long conversation actually. But then the second, this other conversation I had was somebody who came up and she said, um, I wanted to thank you for standing here. Um, and I'm wondering why all of the other churches are still at their booth. Um, why nobody has organized the churches to make a wall around this woman. That um, there's so many other religious people, so many other Christian people here to support us, but everyone is just letting her do this. It doesn't really feel like we're being supported. Um, and that hit me in the heart because I was not going to support them. It was only when Laura called me out and suggested that somebody take direct action that I even thought it would be necessary for someone to because I see a hateful protester and I can just tune her out. I walk past and go, ugh, of course there's one here. But for somebody who has spent their lives feeling like an abomination, they can't just tune that out. So I didn't even think to myself that somebody should go stand up to her. And it was such a learning experience for me that our stickers say love louder because that is a conviction that I have, that we have, that we need to be louder than all of that noise. And a part of that means not just showing up, but causing trouble. So my big learning for the weekend was it's great we're showing up. I need to be louder. I need to uh, get in a little bit more trouble. And I forget who said this quote, but that if you're not getting hit by the same rocks, you're not standing close enough. Um, so that was my experience. We have like a couple minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> however, another person in this congregation who shall remain nameless um, said, why don't we see if she's thirsty and offer her some yeah, water? Yeah. Mm. And she took it. So that's the, the mm -hmm. coin thing. You know. And Joe didn't even like... Um, say your name. Um, Joe didn't <laughs> even like say anything else. He just said, are you thirsty? She just offered the love. So yeah. it's both of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a question. I, I was out of the room. Uh, did, were there more signs? It was no, just it was the just one. Just the one. And it was right in front of you guys. No, oh, I went oh. to her. Oh, you went there. Oh. I went to her she and stood right there the for about <laughs> stood there for about an hour and a half. Uh, talked with way more people out there on the street than I did behind the booth. Yeah. Well, that's um, passed out a ton of brochures. <laughs> Um, Any other people want to share about this particular thing? The God in Love shirts started conversations too on the street. That's mm. the yes, yes, the shirts, the God is Love shirts caused a, sparked a lot of conversation. Good. Yeah. No, the rest of them will be printed by a professional and not ironed on in my kitchen. So These, for those of you who came and got shirts, are limited edition, uh, first edition <laughs> collector's items. So hold on to them. Yeah. I, uh, I did meet somebody who said that they'd been watching us online as well. Um, there's several people in our own community who join us yeah. virtually at some point or another and don't comment or leave their names or anything, but have told me kind of in passing or in private that yeah. um, the, the witness that we have in the community, especially here in Pottstown, is important to them. And there were kids from the high school that showed up and saw our table, right? So that was awesome. Like, they're like, oh, hey, Pottstown, Pottstown, because they saw 
John and Marlene. Um, mm -hmm. so. so I share these things not to brag because I, there can be a lot of virtuous signaling. You can say that, look at us, we're so, so loving. But more as a reflection of what it means to be Jesus, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to think about the ways that we learn from folks who are actually marginalized how to love them. We had ideas. They were great ideas, I think. And I, I think um, if that interaction hadn't happened, I still think a lot of really good happened. Um, but. I think of that, that story where like Jesus calls the tax collector and the Pharisees are like, how dare you? Why would you eat with those people? Why would you touch those people? Why would you let people touch you to make you unclean? You are the teacher. Like you really need to be clean. But that is who Jesus is. And so I, I feel like a lot of what we do together is figuring it out together doing our best to show up in ways that show God's love louder than the hate. And so don't allow these moments to pass you by. Let those lessons be things that continue to ruminate in us, that continue to uh, change our hearts that continue to open us, that continue to help us to see our need for God so that we can be a little less like folks who don't feel like they have any needs, a little less like people who spew hate. Let us pray.